Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about this interesting German helmet that comes from uh, Arnhem in Holland. And first of all, why am I making this video? It's because this helmet was kept by a family in Holland. And um, one of the family members is a history teacher and he wanted to give the helmet to a museum. And I kind of told him, you know, museums have lots and lots of things. 99% is never shown to the public and helmets are pretty basic. And this helmet has a very interesting camouflage and I would be very interested to buy it. Uh, but he still wanted to give it to the museum and lucky for me the museum apparently wasn't interested. So in the end I was able to, to acquire it from him. And what I told him is since it's not in the museum I can make a video about the helmet instead, kind of like a virtual museum. And then anybody around the world can see this helmet in details whenever they want. Uh, and see lots of details about it that they actually couldn't see if they went and saw the helmet behind glass in a museum. So let's start with the story of this helmet. Uh, this is me in Holland when the, the, the family uh, handed the helmet over to me. And you should always document finds as well as you can. So I asked the family to write uh, a letter. So this is what the history teacher wrote. So basically he's saying that in uh, 1945, when the family returned to Arnhem after having been evacuated, they found this helmet in a location called Siependalsweg. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that properly. And then they kept the helmet uh, in the house ever since. And the helmet was actually found by the, the brother-in-law's family, so I also contacted the brother-in-law. And he said the same story and added the details that uh, when he was young, he actually used the helmet sometimes as a motorcycle helmet. Arnhem is very famous, of course, because of the movie A Bridge Too Far, where uh, because this uh, parachute attack occurred uh, in, uh, in September 1944, and they made the famous movie about it. And basically, um, this helmet has nothing to do with that, because it was found in 1945, April 1945, when Arnhem was finally liberated. Uh, but it was found pretty close to where the Arnhem events occurred. This is the John Frost Bridge, the famous bridge, and the helmet you see was found a couple of kilometers away. So it doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with the famous September battle, but it, it is a relic of the final liberation of Arnhem in April 1945, which would have looked like this. So maybe one of these German prisoners is actually uh, the owner of this helmet. So let's uh, start with a few technical details about uh, German helmets in general. Uh, when the war started, this is what a German helmet looked like. It was called the model 1935 helmet and there's three things that stand out. Number one, you see the helmet is painted in this shiny green paint. Number two, you see it has a decal on the side uh, with uh, several colors including red which doesn't seem like a very good idea uh, in the army walking around with something red on your head, you know, when there's a war going on. And then the final detail is that it has this air vent, which is uh, actually another piece of metal added on to the helmet after the helmet is made. So Germans like to over-engineer things, as we know. And uh, before the war started, they made this helmet in a rather uh, complicated way. And then as soon as the war started, uh, reality set in and they modified their design. Uh, they removed that red decal. Uh, the paint you see is now granular paint and gray in color. And then to save time in the construction, the, the air vent is not an added, pieces of an added piece of metal. It's just uh, the helmet is bent into the shape of this air vent. So this means the helmet was better camouflaged and uh, it didn't take as long to build it. So this is a close-up of the model 1935 helmet where the air vent is an added piece of metal and on the helmet from Arnhem you can see that uh, this is actually the later version so the model 1940 helmet. And then if we look at the inside we can see two things. We can see that the the edge of the helmet is bent in and the Germans stopped doing this in 1942 to save time once again. And uh, what we can also see is that the helmet, even though it was already painted dark, uh, granular in the factory, it was repainted in the field at some time. You can see the brush stroke marks uh, with granular paint. So it was uh, repainted at least once. So all this means that um, this helmet was built between 1940 and 1942. So by the time it was found in April 1945, it had been used 
for at least three to five years already. And you can see that when you look at the helmet because at many places the paint is completely worn down to the bare metal. Now a final technical detail on the left side of the helmet. If you look closely you can kind of see this uh, rectangular shape under the paint and what this shows is that the helmet initially had a uh, German army decal on it and when they repainted in the field they didn't have any mercy for the decal. What they wanted was to be camouflaged so they just painted right over the decal. But when it was when it came out of the factory it would have looked like this. So now um, the elephant in the room with this helmet, of course, is these white spots on it. So let's say a few words about camouflage during World War II. So when World War II started, camouflage was not a thing. Camouflage in the sense of uh, having multicolored uniforms. All the major armies had subdued uniforms, so green or brown in color, but nobody had uh, issue uniforms that were multicolor. And these are what German soldiers looked like uh, before the war, early in the war. You can see the helmets are nice and shiny with these red decals. And then uh, this is also early in the war in France. So you can see they're all wearing field gray uniforms. There's no camouflage, but they are starting to adapt. You see this guy in the front has um, a piece of rubber band on his helmet that could be used to attach uh, foliage for camouflage purposes. This is an also another early war picture, so they're wearing, nobody has camouflage and they just all have these rubber bands, however. And these rubber bands can still be found nowadays when helmets are dug up, for example, because they, they resist burial quite well. This is, this is an example. And then the war progressed. The Germans invaded Russia and uh, the first winter happened and it, of course uh, they had uh, no, uh, no uh, winter equipment and they had to adapt in the field. So they painted the uh, helmets uh, white, uh, as you guys can be seen in these pictures. And uh, those can also still be found nowadays. This one was found in a, in a swamp in the Demiansk area. You see it has all this white paint. The same thing happened in North Africa. They had to make tropical uniforms, so yellow in color, and then they painted all the helmets yellow. And even little details uh, were camouflaged, like these are buttons for the tropical uniforms. You can see that they're all painted yellow. And uh, even things like belt buckles were sometimes painted. This one was painted yellow for the desert. So you would think, like, is it really important to paint something so small? Well, apparently the guys in the front lines considered that even small things, small details, could make the difference between being spotted or not, or between life and death. And uh, as, the, as we get towards the end of the war, we see more and more field improvisations, and the soldiers are starting to look more and more messy. Uh, this guy, these guys are wearing um, pieces of American camouflaged parachute over their helmets. Uh, then there's the very famous chicken wire. So this guy put a chicken wire over his helmet so that he could attach uh, leaves and things inside the helmet. These guys also have chicken wire. When you look at footage from 1944 on the, on the Western Front, like lots and lots of guys have this chicken wire stuff. And then you can see that they're also wearing camouflaged smocks. Um, here you see that all the guys are equipped with uh, factory-made helmet covers. So each and every one of them has one. And uh, note, that, note that this guy has a very nice smile at the same time. Um, this shows German army soldiers with camouflaged uniforms. So the German army, their, their basic uniform always remained field gray, but then they started having smocks or winter clothes or overclothes that were camouflaged uh, late in the war. And then the SS, they, they had actual camouflaged uniforms where you just wore the camouflage with nothing underneath, like you can see here. So they were the most in advance when it came to camouflage. And it was kind of the same with uh, the American army. Uh, they were a few years behind the Germans, but you know, early in the war they had no camouflage and then as time went by, you know, late in the war the Marines had camouflage uniforms. Uh, some units improvised uh, camouflage. I made a video about Marvin Moles' helmet of the 517th Parachute Infantry in southern France where I go into details about the Americans uh, improvising camouflage in uh, August 1944, so you can go and watch that if you have more interest. So let's come back to this helmet from Arnhem. So it has these white spots all over it. 
And it's pretty obvious that this is supposed to be some kind of a winter camouflage. It looks pretty messy, of course, but uh, by this time in the war, the Germans weren't really worried anymore about looking messy. And this helmet we saw was found in the spring of 1945 in Holland, so it makes sense that um, it was just after the winter and you might find a winter camouflaged helmet at that period. And this is about the messiness. I mean, when you look at late war pictures of German soldiers surrendering, they often look more like homeless guys than like soldiers. Everybody has a different uh, type of headdress, a different type of camouflage. The uniforms are worn down, the faces are depressed, the hair isn't cut. So they kind of look like bums uh, late in the war. This helmet was found in Holland, where it's kind of slushy, muddy winters, not pure white winters like in Russia. And that's probably why it was camouflaged in this peculiar way with uh, these spots and not just completely painted in white. And here's my attempt at simulating uh, an environment in Holland. And you see that the helmet blends in pretty nicely. Now let's look at some details of the camouflage. Um, what's neat here is that you can see that where the white paint was applied over field gray, it remained white, but where it was applied directly over the bare metal, some rust bleed appeared over the years. So you can see that it's definitely all the paint. And then another neat detail that's quite common on these overpainted helmets is fingerprints. You can see fingerprints of uh, the soldier who painted it in the paint. So I have a theory, maybe one day we'll have a named helmet with a fingerprint and then we'll be able to go into the archives, find the guy's fingerprint and match the fingerprint to the helmet. Maybe that's science fiction for the moment, but it might actually happen one day. And then another neat detail, um, one of the guys in Holland from the family said he wore this helmet uh, for riding his motorcycle after the war. And here you can see that somebody after the war did not like the white spots on the helmet. You can understand why, because it looks really messy. So he tried to scratch them off. It looks like he used a screwdriver and you see he scratched this, this white spot off. He scratched half of this one off. And luckily for us, he got discouraged and stopped scratching it. Uh, so most of the spots remain intact. And now last but not least, let's see the inside of the helmet. So uh, the family historian oiled the inside of the helmet. So that's something that if you have a helmet, you should not do. Um, collectors don't like it. And it's also not good for the leather on the long term, but whatever, it's a small mistake. And what's interesting here with the inside is that we have the soldier's name written inside. And that's why the family historian had initially contacted me, hoping that we would be able to research this name. So my first rule of thumb to see if a name is researchable or not is I see how common is it. So what I do to check that, I go on the German War Graves Commission website and I type in the family name. And in this, in this case, the name is Krönert. And you can see that there's at least 76 guys uh, with that name listed on the German War Graves Commission. That means it's a pretty common name and it means that there was probably several hundred guys with that family name who fought during World War II, which is a bad start. Now in this case, uh, we're lucky because there's not just a family name, there's also what seems to be initials, so H.M. So apparently this guy was called H.M. Krönert. And the good thing is that there's two initials so, as if the guy had a, a double name, which is kind of rare in German helmets to see two initials like this. Uh, so I thought maybe, since we know exactly where the helmet was found and there's these two initials, maybe we'll be able to look the guy up. But then I realized, see, the, the ink for the initials is not the same ink as for the family name. Uh, there's also quite a large space between the two. Uh, there's also, see, this M is like printed style, whereas here the N is in cursive style. Now you could tell me, you know, here the N is not a capital, whereas here the M is a capital, maybe that's why he capitalized it. But basically my impression is that the HM and the Kronert don't belong together. Uh, this is probably one guy's initials, HM, and then the helmet changed hands and then somebody else wrote his full name. It's, it's very common in German helmets to find two or three different names. And if there's only the family name Krönert, well then that is really too common and we're not going to be able to research this helmet because there's going to be hundreds of matches. It's a huge research project. And then you'll probably find, you know, two or three that were in the Arnhem area 
and you'll have no way of knowing who the helmet belonged to of those three. So for now, I consider this helmet to be non-researchable when it comes to the name. Now that's it for the autopsy of this helmet. Uh, you see there's lots of little interesting things that can be said about it when you, when you know the details. I hope you found this video interesting. And uh, if you want to do your own uh, research projects or are having difficulties or need some advice, you can uh, send me an email at this address. And if you have uh, old military things lying around that you don't particularly care about, uh, depending on what they are, maybe they would be interesting for me. And so uh, if you would be interested to perhaps sell them, you can also always contact me. And uh, if I'm interested in it, I'll give you a good price. And if I'm not, I'll tell you approximately what the value is and where you can maybe sell it. So I hope that was interesting and have a nice day. Bye bye.